Okay, hello everybody. <coughs> How are you? Uh, we apparently, I forgot I must say, <laughs> we reached to the beginning of chapter 8. <coughs> and uh, at the end of uh, uh, creativity, uh, realistic creative effort, chapter 7, um, I dealt with this issue of the power of the imagination. And um, I um, packed in there uh, this idea of Buddha land building, which is an exoteric, Mahaya, public Mahayana thing, not a secret thing. And uh, I referred to the Vimalakirti teaching, sutra, or discourse, how in the Vimalakirti the Buddha showed that the compassion power of an all enlightening beings is powerful enough to shape our universe. It doesn't create it. There's no pretense that Buddha is omnipotent and creates it. But it's like engineering. It shapes the material that's there. And it shapes it through at the most powerful from the most subtle level through mind and through language, through sound. And uh, the power of mantra is indirectly evoked there. And the Buddha reveals it to the assembly at the beginning of the Vimalakirti teaching sutra uh, that uh, he reveals a whole kind of giant planetarium, a kind of really extraordinary thing. And in that giant planetarium, everyone sees the whole world and many worlds, not just in this planet, but many other planets. They see that in a vision, all the rivers and lakes and different human beings and animals and oceans and mountains and all of this. And... Um, it's right at the beginning. He shows this, makes a miracle. Uh, 500 kids come out of a city, very wealthy city with very jeweled parasols. They lay them on the ground in front of the Buddha. And he fuses them into a huge, uh, which I couldn't figure out what it was, because it covered the galaxy, not just the planet, <clears throat> not just this, the field in which he was talking to them, in the grove of uh, Amrapali, uh, outside of Vaishali. Uh, but they see the whole galaxy in there and different planets in the galaxy with sort of humanoid mammalian animal uh, uh, habitats shaped there. And then, uh, uh, and uh, so they see the interconnectedness of nature. And, um, and then they, they praise that as amazing, blah, blah, blah. You know? And then they ask the question, well, you know, it's said that a Buddha a bodhisattva, rather, it's a being who wants to become fully enlightened, who, uh, who imagines a state of being where you, your love, your wisdom about the nature of reality enables your love and compassion to shape things around you and around other beings in such a way as to optimize their chances of becoming enlightened themselves. And that's called the Buddha land, Buddha field, Buddha kshetra in Sanskrit. Uh, Dakshing, a pure land, a pure field. I like to call it a Buddha verse because it's, it's really different from a universe. <laughs> it's a universe that turns around the idea of enlightenment, people becoming fully enlightened. And enlightenment doesn't just mean there's a light bulb in their head, it means they are completely aware of what really, reality and what is unreal. And they are therefore totally loving to everything they're interconnected to. And since the past is infinite, there's no beginning to it, and the future is endless, that no beings have become that kind of fully enlightened being is not sensible, because there has been infinite beings having infinite chances to do so. And then the fact that you can't do that is not sensible, because you have the infinite time to get bored with being unenlightened and stupid and struggling and suffering. And there's a path, and uh, no one else can make you enlightened, but you, there's, a, there's a curriculum whereby you can do it. And so that's the one. Then two, they asked the Buddha the question, well, how can you, we see how you can change your own mind to become fully aware of things. That we can see. And we want to do that. There are people who ask the question, the 500 young people. But what we don't understand is how can you change the whole world? It seems so solid, so huge. How can you make it a Buddhaverse from a sort of self-centered universe filled with self-centered beings? 
which it seems to be, who are sort of all against each other, kind of therefore it's really a struggle. And he said, well, you sort of can't in a way. And he says, because you, because in a way it is, the way you see it is unreal in the sense of it's not the real reality. And if you make it good, that's also a little bit unreal, but it's like you're shaping something plastic. You're shaping an illusion like an artist does. And so you go ahead and do it anyway, even though it's kind of impossible. You do it. He makes a very puzzling idea. And of course, and then, he, and then at one point, and so then he describes this wonderful universe where everybody's really happy. And then people say, oh, I can't believe that. And then he sort of makes another miracle where he creates an illusion, temporary illusion in people's minds that they see everything as sort of perfect. Like, you know, instead of looking out and seeing a tree that grows leaves that I can't eat, <laughs> and I have to go get a giraffe to eat them, and then I have to eat the giraffe, or whatever, you know, and that's really not nice for the giraffe, etc. you know, this kind of difficult planet that we think we have. Uh, you suddenly see the leaves as perfect because they're making oxygen, not food, but they're giving me food of air, of energy. And everything is perfectly enhancing my interconnectedness. You can sort of re see things that way. And so they do that temporarily and say, oh, this therefore is a land where I have every opportunity to become fully aware of it and also to shape everything in whatever field of, of, uh, of in, in interconnection that I'm aware of to the most positive thing I can possibly shape it, make it beautiful and so on. And then there's, since uh, life is unlimited, if time is on death, there's only change of embodiments. And therefore, it's like going through doors from one house to another, changing clothes from one outfit to another. And therefore, why couldn't in infinite time I get there myself? I can even shape worlds like a Buddha. So he, he, um, that's then the message of the Vimalakirti, and then everything in the Vimalakirti says that. And in that light, this already is a Buddha land. And Buddha reveals this is Shakyamuni Buddha's Buddha land. Or, and the Shakyamuni himself may be only an emanation of Bhairochana Buddha in a, in a different sutra of the flower ornament. And the point is that there are infinite Buddhas in the universally good Bodhisattva Samatha Bhadra procedure. You see every atom of this universe has other universes in it. And every atom, every atom of those universes in every atom of this universe have other universes in it. And so you go down to the micro-infinite that there's this positive energy everywhere. And you come to clear light idea and you, you envision the ultimate reality of the universe as total goodness, freedom that is so free it's capable of being responsible in its interconnection in all good rather than maybe evil too or something. No, it's all good. And so that's what, um, that's what we ended at last time, but just to recapitulate the wonderful context within which we move into realistic mindfulness. And so, and I want to read just the last paragraph there. So once the creative energy, and so, and he says, yeah, and uh, so don't feel discouraged by the seeming solidity of the world. Because what the world is, is the interlocking of infinite minds, numbers of beings. And within those infinite beings, there are many gods, actually. Don't ever listen to anybody who tells you, oh, Buddhists are atheists. That's not true. Buddhists do not believe one god created everything, so they're not creator monotheists. They think that's yes, senseless to blame one person for the seeming imperfections of the world. It seems incorrect. So, but they do believe they're very powerful beings in specific spheres, of course. And those are, you call them gods, you call them angels, you call them actually bad ones, demons, <clears throat> and, and, and um, all kinds of other beings than the ones that materialists think are there, you know. Ghosts are there, beings in the underworld, goblins, fairies, all kinds of things. So they are not atheists, they just don't believe in in a one-way monotheism type of thing, you know, single-person monotheism projecting into, some, into this ultimate good infinite energy of the cosmos 
sort of one person being that energy. You know, they, don't, they don't project a cosmic dictator, in other words, just like they like democracy where you don't have a political dictator. So therefore, Buddha says, since it's an interlocking of minds, the world, if you shift minds, not just yours, but everybody's, then yours first, and then you in, interact with others in such a way as to help them shift. And then that creates a positive world, a Buddha world, a world where everyone loves everyone else. Everyone knows everyone else's issues and problems, and one's own also, and everyone wants everybody else to be excellent because of being interconnected with oneself. So the self-other duality where you can harm another to benefit yourself, you wrongly think. And everyone wants to benefit everyone. So everyone is a little less worried about themselves because they trust everyone else. And everyone has everyone else working for them. So it's all for one, for all, for everyone of all. It's a wonderful positive feedback loop. And that creates a Buddha verse. Okay? So now within that, so he says, so once the creative energy of your own mind focuses on the seminal, super subtle realm, that's the soul realm, the realm you know, beneath the atoms of pure energy in our, the core of our being, of our continuum, constantly changing, super subtle being, you know, quantum foam, where we exist as streams within quantum foam, super subtle realm accessible only by the coarse, subtle, and super subtle mind, you turn to the third super education, the education in mind and in samadhi, concentrated meditation, entrancement, trance and meditation, the supernormally empowering, I never say supernatural, but in a way relatively magical, supernormal empowering mental concentration that reshapes the world into continuous, beautiful, loving art by reshaping the mind into the bliss overflowing awareness that lovingly enfolds all embodiments. So we begin, and it begins, with the realistic mindfulness. This, by the way, is the whole essence of this book, which called Buddhas Have More Fun. Originally, Wisdom is Bliss, the four friendly fun facts that do change your life, can change your life if you, if you learn what they are. <clears throat> and here is where... In a way, this book moves beyond the division between esoteric and exoteric. In a little bit, the, in other words, the secret stuff in the ancient history, because of the danger of the mystic, and mystic being in danger from repressive political systems and social systems, and people's fears and so forth, of that level of personal energy of the great Mahasiddha and so on, what they call in India the great adept, who kind of has a higher kind of personal energy than people expect. And therefore, in more very repressive societies, they're often persecuted, burned at the stake, or crucified, or, to, or like they did to Jesus, you know, who was a high adept for sure. He could like, you know, make food out of out of stones, you know, make wine out of water, you know, for sure. You couldn't kill him. You could tear up his body, and he could repair it with mind. That's an adept, but it isn't supernatural. That's part of nature. That mind is what, it's like the CPU of the universe. And especially when mind becomes collective mind by interconnecting with infinite other minds. And then it's, then it's unstoppable. It can even influence rock, actually, which we'll see later. But anyway, so anyway, I'm putting, you know, the, the Eightfold Path curriculum is the esoteric, no, exoteric, you know, publicly available, sort of safe curriculum for the mendicant originally, although it can be used also by lay people. Uh, but I'm putting in here all the, the uh, and in that, normally the imagination is suppressed. So because the imagination is hooked up to the routinized negative culture, suppressed culture, of you know, patriarchal kingship dominated, military violence dominated cultures that we've had on the planet for the last few thousand years. 
And, but now we are at a point where that culture has to be changed. So the esoteric has to be understood by the scientists of the exoteric. And so I have tried to pour in this book in a beginning way the deeper creative imagination along with the transcending of the negative imagination, you know, into the sort of fusing them together. That's why in creating efforts, Sambyak Vyayama, I have put in Vidya, heroic effort of bodhisattvas, and then the trans more transformative effort of the imaginative level bodhisattva, the artist bodhisattva, who is trying to reshape the world as well as their own mind. And putting that into the foundational curriculum. That's, that's what this, this, because I think that's the job. I'm inspired by my guru, his holiness, the Dalai Lama, that that is the, the, the job today because we face different challenges than the patriarchal. Patriarchal, violence-dominated societies cannot become a planetary society within a delicate environment shaped to enhance human life. Patriarchal violent society will destroy that environment and the people in it will destroy each other with the power of their mind making weaponry so powerful and making polluting industry so powerful. It breaks the environment and they break each other. So now the deeper level methodologies have to be understood by the scientists and mastered by them as well as their, so they can re-engineer the minds, their own and others, in a new way, okay? But only first their own. AI is not going to come from anywhere else and do it for them. <laughs> AI has to be shaped by beings who have already achieved OI, optimal intelligence, the intelligence of freedom and responsibility, wisdom and compassion, <clears throat> okay? Realistic Mindfulness, Chapter 8. The supereducation in mind begins when your creativity flows inward into the subtlest recesses of your mind. This can be called mindfulness, forms of which have become extraordinarily popular around the world. That's a wonderful thing. The English mindfulness word comes from Sanskrit smriti or pali sati, which actually means memory, remembering. Because in a way, what mindfulness is, is instead of remembering, usually we remember we are imagining um, ways we perceived experiences we had in the past. That's what remembering sort of does. And in a way, we spend a lot of effort on that. We sort of resent things that went wrong. We romanticize things that went right and sort of feel lost from them and feel sad about losing them and so on. And um, we sort of divide our awareness of the present by dwelling a lot in the past, either with, in either positive or, or sentimental uh, uh, ways. And then, then we transfer that also by anticipating the future, fearing terrible things that are going to happen and or fantasizing about great things that could happen. And then, that, therefore, we kind of don't remember where we right are right now. So we, do, so we take the energy of the anticipation and the energy of the remembering, and we put it into being, focusing on what we're going on right this minute. Even though when we do it really strongly, we realize that we can't, the minute keeps eluding us because the time is a flow. And so when we try to find now, the minute... Even the word now, is it on the N or the O that the now is? And the line, the moving line of the editor of a film or something or of, the, you know, of an audio thing, the moving line never stops. You know? And there's no place on a line because the line is not, is a, has a beginning and an end. It has one side and another side. And the exact line has, is not there. It's just a concept. Let you know that. But we'll go deeper into that. So, memory. Among the eight branches of the path, it is the seventh, the beginning of the third super education or higher education, the super education in concentration, samadhi, 
or mind, chitta. So samadhi, samadhi is a wonderful word. D means intelligence, actually. And A means aimed somewhere, addressing something. And the sum means total, complete, full. So full, focused intelligence. And then we call that one-pointed intelligence. So it's like you have an image in your mind of a blue dot, a blue circle, you know, or a diamond, uh, or a white, or a light, and you just, your mind just goes bong, and in your mind's eye you just see that without wavering. You don't think anything else, you know, it doesn't waver, and since your mind's eye doesn't have to blink, it's just held boom, like that you have that ability. Now, of course, it's a little bit useless just to hold your mind on a blue spot, or a light, or a diamond, because, so then you're stuck, you're stuck on a diamond. But the point is, having that ability to focus on an exploration, or on an analysis, or on a discovery, or on a positive emotion, a theme, is very, gives you much greater mental power. As you know, because you've memorized things, you know, you have to pass tests in your education, you know that. In order to do that, you have to be able to concentrate in such a way that you're not distracted in order to memorize something. Okay, which actually means memory, which actually means memory, which actually means memory. In fact, you have to repeat that many, many times, and then without looking, you say, which actually means memory. Okay? Realistic remembering and realistic concentration make up that third super-education with what we discussed in the last chapter, realistic creativity as the spark because the realistic creativity is where you realize that you are the master of your moods. You are the master of your emotion. Because you know, you can reason, you can remember that sometimes good things happen to you, but you were in a bad mood, and so you still were unhappy. Sometimes bad things happen to you, but you were in such a good mood, you didn't, they didn't bother you, and you remained happy. So there's, some, there's a facility in your mind that controls your mood. Not necessarily what externally happens to you. Although some extreme thing, of course, will derail that unless you have exceptionally powerful concentration on, on your inner source of your mental energy and your mood. Do you follow? Even, you know, they say, you know, like think that how when you meditate, if you look at people meditating in a room full of meditators, you look at a photograph, one of the things you might notice is everybody looks very grim. Mm -hmm. And concentrate. They tend to look very serious. Whereas Thich Nhat Hanh, one of the great meditation teachers, Vietnamese Zen master, he used to say that one of the things you should try to do when you meditate is smile. Because if you smile, you physiologically, just by smiling, <laughs> endorphins are released in your brain. You know, he he picked that up from the neuroscientist because he's very intelligent. And that means you feel better. You have a better mood. So therefore, you have more energy on your meditation. If you look all grim, then you're having painful feelings in your you know, brain. The opposite cortisol, stress hormone is releasing in your brain. And you feel stressed out. And you feel, oh, meditation is causing me. I shouldn't meditate. I can't meditate. It's causing me uh, stress. But you're causing it. That's the point. Not meditation is not causing it. Because you're not smiling. <laughs> That's why realistic creativity is the spark. When you realize you can change the whole world by changing your mind, you then have a very powerful motivation to first understand how your mind works by remembering to look at it, by reversing your usual outward, extroverted sort of way of looking. Oh, what's happening? Oh, the fan is going. Oh, thank goodness I feel cool. Oh, the sun is shining. Oh, great, it's a good day. And instead of constantly looking out for whatever circumstances you're in, you're looking inward. How am I reacting to all of these things? You become focused on that. So that's why it's the spark. If you just take a taste of how creativity can enable you to see the world in ways that really make you happy, then you realize, wow, well, I've got to find out where in me is the focus. And how do I get to that focus to keep it always on the good? so as to keep me motivated in a positive way. Together they parallel the fifth of the six transcendent virtues, <clears throat> that's of the Bodhisattva. They're unpacking Mahayana here into the 
is the Eightfold Path, which is Theravada, the foundational renunciative mendicant uh, curriculum, where you have the six transcendent virtues, uh, you know, generosity, justice, tolerance and patience, creativity, uh, creative effort, concentration and wisdom. Those are the first six. There are then four more, but those are the first six. And so the fifth of those, which is one of the ways usually they just think of them as six, is dhyana, Sanskrit dhyana, or which we can translate as meditation, and Chinese chan, and Korean son, and Japanese zen, which we know famously in English as zen, which is sort of just the word dhyana changed through the pronunciation in those other languages. Chan, first it goes to chan in China, dhya, cha. Korean, then the chan becomes son, and then the Japanese, the son becomes sen, zen. <laughs> and then zen, zen becomes zen in English. And we, have, we know what zen means in English. Zen of motorcycle maintenance, concentrating on motorcycle maintenance. But this, the meditation also then has to do with, with dia means intelligence. People only think meditation means you blank your mind. No, you focus your mind. So D, the D part of, of dhyana, which is a gerund from the verb D to think, so and to be intelligent. So dhyana is thinking intelligently. That's what meditating is. So meditating is not the one point of concentration where you go beyond thinking, actually. That's a word called bhavana, which means realizing something. It's like your mind is making it come into being. So we don't think of meditation as making things come to being. We think of this surveying them, exploring them. Whereas what, what realization is what makes something real. And that's the third thing in wisdom. But that's another story. Anyway, I will, I will go back to that later. Okay, which partners with the sixth and most important transcendent virtue, wisdom, prajna. Now, wisdom, prajna, again, nya means to know. And pra means super, to super know. So it's also another word for intelligence. But it's analytic in tendency. Uh, it can end up in one pointed sort of experiential, even non-dual knowing, where in other words, you become what you know. And in a way, it always is that, but that's not how we conceive it, actually, and not how we interpret it. But we always, we always, uh, we always when we look up in the sky, you just go on in the sky. But then we say, no, I'm a part, I'm a person, that's the sky. We conceptually separate ourselves from floating off into space. But actually, the direct experience, visual experience, you, you almost enter what you look at, if you look at it very closely. And you can do that if you have a high concentration. And you don't let conceptualization disturb you or distract you from being one with what's around you. So prajna is how you get to that, by analyzing the conceptualizing barriers to direct experience of things. And so it's, the prajna is like mindfulness, actually. Mindfulness in the, seven, in the Eightfold Path is like prajna in the Sixfold Transcendences. They're inter, they interconnect in that way. But they put them in a different relationship in the, uh, in the two things. Uh, uh, the, and the... In a way, they, they insist on a kind of wisdom at the beginning of the Eightfold Path, which is the realistic worldview and realistic motivation. That's where the wisdom is taught, under those different things. So that's really interesting. Why that is, we could go more, but I want to, keep, I want to read a little bit. The transformative intellectual wisdom attained by analytic meditation, which is what vipassana actually means. V means by dividing. Pashana means to see, or vipassana in Pali, vipassana in Sanskrit. So it means to see dividingly, vipassana. And seeing dividingly means to see through something by taking it apart, seeing how its parts and parts assemble, seeing how its causal process happens, and, and in a way it eventually dissolves under that analysis, and you find f the freedom of the thing. And, and which makes you responsible for your construction of it, actually, rather than that there's a place of freedom apart from the thing. That's not correct. It's the, the space and the thing, the thing occupies the space and the freedom. have to know that ahead of time. Anyway, 
Uh, that meditation cannot drill down far enough to change unconscious misknowing habit patterns without the energy focusing of concentration, contemplation, non-discursive meditation, or which ultimately is, is realization. Bhavana, make something come to be. That's really the higher one, highest one. And that's where your analytic prajna meets with your samadhi or dhyana, where then you have one-pointed vipassana, and so vipassana and shamatha, that's another term that means just to stay calmly, come together, and you just go right through to clear light, and then you go right through clear light to the infinite universe. Because that's what it is. <laughs> it's not something apart from everything that's made of. It is what all the things are. So there's no place that's it apart from the things. That's a very important thing to be aware of ahead of time. Okay, please. Usually our constant stream of remembering gets stuck in the past as we go into reveries and our memories of what happened to us at this or that time. At the same time, a mental scattering occurs in anticipating things where we imagine things that might happen in the future. We remember the future, you could say. When we take focus away from remembering the past and anticipating the future, we can remember to be more and more aware and mindful of what is going on in the present. When we do this indeed, we can gradually become lucidly aware. That is to say, you know, we always talk about lucid dreaming, and we will do more about that, but here we're talking about lucidly awake. Because when you're only maximum one-third present, because your mind is half filled with memories of things and half filled with anticipating future things, and you're barely here in the present, you're in a sort of rumination state where your mind is divided, then you're not lucidly awake. You're just sort of awake like a robot, mechanically awake, because your mind is not fully attentive to every aspect of what's going on in the, in the exact moment. Lucidly aware and lucidly awake. That's wonderful. To look at it from a different perspective, we use the term, oh, good, here, here, here. lucid dreaming, where we have learned to be self-aware during dreams without waking up. When we gain skill in mindful awareness during our waking hours, we are developing lucid waking finding much more vivid detail in every moment. If we take stock of how we spend our time doing things while our mind multitasks and thinks about other things, scattering itself around, we are hardly aware of what we're actually doing in the moment. That could be called mindless waking or sleep waking, like sleepwalking. There are traditionally four focuses of mindfulness of, quote, what we're now calling remembering the present. And one is remembering or being mindful of the body, remembering or being mindful of the physical and mental sensations, remembering and being mindful of the mind, and remembering and being mindful of the mental objects, things in the mind. Those are called the four focuses of mindfulness. Some, you will read some of what they call the four stations of mindfulness or foundations of mindfulness, which is really wrong. It's like mindfulness is sort of going to move from them. But actually, that's what mindfulness is going to move to them. That's key. So, so therefore, they are objects of the mindfulness. They are not the foundations of the mindfulness so much. But in a way, you know, that's little, the imperfection of language is such that we can't really get too upset about it. But upasana means closely place it. So it means focus it on something rather than stand on. You can practice the first round. Now let's go practice together. You can practice the first round just to become aware of them without looking right away at their nature. Once you become lucid about what is there, you discover that the body is funky. The sensations are mostly stressful. The mind is ever-changing and actually unfindable. 
and mental objects are coreless, insubstantial, illusory, and relative. Realistic mindfulness constantly looks realistically with the inner eye at body sensations, mind, and objects. Now, let's do this a little bit. Or let's practice what they call practice. I mean, actually, listening to me is practice. Reading this book is practice. I don't like when they say practice is only thinking in a meditative way. We're always thinking and when we walk around. So we're always meditating in that sense. And so practice is trying to be conscious in whatever pose or posture you're in. But now let's meditate for a minute. So sit up. If you're in a chair, cross your ankles, fold your hands, be concentrated a little bit, and then let your eyes actually ideally partially close and just look down your nose, you know, becoming a little cross-eyed. But in order to be bored with your visual field where you normally everything distracts you all the time, or if you want, close your eyes, but that, since you're probably tired here in America in our busy culture, you might fall asleep. <laughs> but never mind. So sit like this. And then think, okay, my body. The way to bring my awareness to my body is by focusing on my breathing. Because the one thing my body is doing that attracts my attention when I'm not looking at it is I breathe. And I automatically do it. Although when I focus on it, I might tend to breathe deeper or more quickly or slower. In other words, by being aware of it, you tend to interfere with it. Try not to. Just notice that you're breathing. When you notice that you're breathing, you immediately come upon the body. And then you can have a picture in your mind that the, according to whatever your notion of your anatomy is, you have, you know, brain, heart, throat, senses, eyeballs, ears, nose, tongue, skin, that's touch, inner membranes, and those five senses. And then your mind can range around within them. But you're just looking at the body now. So you'll go into a map of the body. And as you go into the map of the body, what you notice is it's gurgling and bubbling, and the heart is pumping, and the breath is going in and out, and there's gurgling in your stomach because you had breakfast or lunch <laughs> or dinner. And <clears throat> you kind of get into the funkiness of the body pretty quickly. But we don't want to do it at length. We're just reviewing. That's the object you're looking for here in your remembering. You're remembering you have a body. That's a really important thing to do. Because we go around just living in our memories and our thoughts. Because actually our body is not in the past. And our body is not in the futures that we are anticipating. Our body is only right here. So in a way also coming into the body, being awareness of the body, brings us into the present moment very strongly. So, but then, and then we notice the stressfulness in the body. And we'll be sitting. And if we're trying to not move by meditating, we'll have a little pain in the hip or in the knee or in the ankle or in the back or in the shoulders or in the head, you know, etc. So we'll immediately see all kinds of stress. So we should smile to relieve the stress. Whether they have content in the smile or not, we should smile. All right? So that's the body. Okay, then, then we notice... When we're going around, not just in the conceptual map we have of the body, like thinking about our brain, our heart, our lungs, and all this, we, where, how do we connect to the body? And right now, I have a feeling in my left knee, which tends to be painful when I sit like this. I have a feeling on my buttocks, on the, on the pillow of the chair. I have a feeling in my ankle pressing against the, uh, the calf. I have a feeling in my back against the back of the chair, the little breeze in the air on my skin. So I'm having sensations. So second object of mindfulness is your sensations. People say feelings. In many translations you will read it, they say feelings, but I don't think that's good in English since feelings can mean emotion. And emotions are reactions to sensations. And these are not the reactions, these are just the sensations. So right now I'm feeling a little bit of pain on my buttock, my knee, 
My shoulders feel a little cramped or something. Shoulder blades. So I notice that I have lots of sensations. And if I, I go, I'm hearing kind of a humming sound. I guess the fans in the room. I'm hearing my own voice. I'm smelling nothing special because I, my own smell might be unpleasant, but I have a little sinus, so I don't smell it. I'm tasting whatever I last ate, leftover residue. And touch is sort of where my bones are sitting and blah, blah. So I'm not going to do this at length, but that's, this, that's the mindfulness on the sensations. So, and then I realized that my sensation, I only notice when I go to pick it out in my experience of my body. So when I think about my left knee, I go over there, oh, that's a little crampy now. Feels a little crampy. So I kind of wiggle it. If there was a Zen master here, he would give me a little tap. <laughs> I sort of move a little bit to diff diffuse the pressure. So my mind is connecting to the body through its sensations. I noticed that. So that's the mindfulness and sensations, which we do at length as we do all go along, but we're just inventorying. Then I want to look back at the mind itself. So what is the mind that, it, that has these inner objects? For example, I can think about what I'm hearing now. That's my mind consciousness going to my ear consciousness sounds that I'm hearing, and my mind is now interpreting the sounds of the words and the meanings. So my mind is doing a lot of interpreting. The brain is filling up things, the meaning of the words, blah, blah, blah. You know, my mind is acting with the instruments of my body quite a lot. And then I keep looking, where is the actual mind that isn't the body? And, you know, if I look, then when I do this mindfulness, what happens is it kind of tends to disappear. Where is my mind in the precious, this particular exact moment? But the moment, it's when I try to catch the mind, which I'm looking at with the mental sense, and I'm focusing on the idea of mind, so I'm using concepts, and I look at it, I, in a way I can't find anything. It keeps eluding me, becomes elusive to me. So we kind of let go of the idea that there's a unitary mind, and we kind of realize that there's some subtle thing that we're not fully aware of quite what it is. And that's then the, the mindfulness of mind. And then when you go more deeper on that, that has a very profound impact on the way you feel. But we're not dealing with that right now. Because the fourth one veers away from that and goes beyond that and looks at mental objects. And then in a way we realize that when we're thinking about looking for our mind or being mindful of our mind itself, that we have a notion of our mind, my Bob Thurman mind. It knows English, it identifies things in English, it uses geometry, it uses imagery as well, and sense, you know, remember memory of color and shape and form and momentum and different things. So these are all concepts that I have, with which I interpret and I can, I can describe to myself what my mind is doing. But in a way, therefore, my mind itself is a kind of mental object that when I try to really pin down, seems to elude me. So, but anyway, I can sort of have a feeling that is there. I do have that. Because I think I'm still doing something. I'm making a continuum of an effort. And that must be coming from my mind. But when I turn to catch my mind, it, it keeps eluding me. And the present, because the present keeps eluding me. Everything seems to elude me when I was trying to look at mine. But now I'm not doing so much of that. I'm just looking at things as objects. And as a mental object, even in my mind, I realize that I'm interpreting, I'm placing, I'm describing, I'm labeling things in my mind. So I have an idea of a body. I have an idea of a mind. I have an idea of a personality, Bob Thurman. I have an idea of a sensation, a pain, or a pleasure. I have an idea, oh, there's a lot of ideas, mental objects. And then in the mental objects, I rehearse a lot of them, and we'll come back to it. But they say the highest and best set of mental objects are the Eightfold Path and the Four Friendly Fun Facts, the acceptance of the stressfulness of interrelating to things, 
uh, that we, you know, uh, they, when we don't quite know what they are, and when, when, when we don't quite know what we are, but we must still kind of force to interrelate. We realize the stressfulness of that, and that's fun, because we're not looking for a non-stressful interrelationship that hard. And then second, the realization that therefore the sensations are where there's a mind-body kind of, ba you know, like frontier. And we spend a lot of time on that. And then we look at our mind for the mind itself and we realize the elusiveness and the elusiveness is even the moment in which we are looking. And then we deal with mental objects and the last of which are the four friendly fun facts. And there, the greatest mental objects is freedom, nirvana, pleasure, freedom from suffering, pleasant and agreeable state that there must be because there seems to be a gamut between the horrors, horribly painful state and a highly pleasurable one. And if we extend those out toward infinity, conceptually, we get really scared of the super painful one. We get really powerful craving for a super pleasurable one called nirvana by some, could be called heaven by others, could be called many different things. So that's the fourth, uh, and that's the third friendly fun fact. And then the curriculum for reaching that is to do the mindfulness that we're doing in the samadhi. Okay, so we did a little meditation, ding, based on that paragraph, just to identify the four objects of the mindfulness. Popularly in the West, people think of mindfulness as being mainly one aspect of the mindfulness of the body, which is mindfulness of the breath, breath being considered the bridge between mind and body. In other words, when you go on just concentrating on the breath, and my knee took over there, <laughs> well, called mindfulness of the breath, when you do that, breath, uh, breath being considered the bridge between mind and body. So when you first do mindfulness practice, you get a little nervous because you realize that there's a whole cacophony going on inside your mind. But then once you get to see it more comprehensively and you can move around among your thoughts, you develop a little bit of critical awareness and you can change channels. You have a sort of clicker. You finally get a remote control in your own mind you know, about the channels in your own mind and you can click from one channel to another. In other words, and the way you do that is you try to hold your mind just on breathing and by counting them. One, you're no longer looking at what breathing is, which its boundaries between breathing and some muscular contractions in your chest and lung <laughs> diaphragm. <laughs> it's very complicated. But you're just, you're just doing it, and then you just simplify your approach to what you're doing by counting. One, two, you know, that's how they usually do. And in doing that, <clears throat> what happens is, at first, you become aware of how mind is filled with streams of distracting thoughts, which are your memories and your anticipations, a lot of them, and your inner chatter, you know. And you just try to come back to the breath from them, and you begin to realize you can move around among all that inner chatter. And then what people tend to do, mainly mindful practice, really stops being vipassana, seeing critically or analytically, and become shamatha, which means just staying peacefully. Because then you're sort of only staying with one, two, three, four, like that, which becomes sort of a one-pointed thing. And with the counting, of course, you're just only aware of the breathing. And you sort of do it at the in exhalation, and you pick, how do you know exhalation is going on? Well, you feel the air coming out of your nostrils or you feel the compression in your diaphragm or in your abdomen and pushing in and out as you breathe. And so you're rearing toward just becoming calm. And that's also very helpful, but it also can be a little bit of a trap. And in a way, it's departing from vipassana and becoming shamatha, just staying calmly. And you can get a little bit, you can dull your intelligence by doing that too much. So you have to stay balanced in that and come back to the vipassana where you keep seeing and analyzing what you see. And it's like where the third, the third focus of mindfulness on mind, where you begin to cope with the elusiveness of what you think is your object. 
It's not just the elusiveness of your distractions and you're moving away from them that you're doing with shamatha. But it's also you're seeing the distraction, you're even seeing the thing you're focusing on, that you can't really encompass its reality. You just can count it or you can point at it in your mind. So this then is where you come back to vipassana, where you'll become very peaceful and you'll become very calm. Okay? But you can move around among your things. When, when, and so you shouldn't try to go to just a state of dead calm. When you, the more calm you get, the more you look more at the nature of what you're looking at. And so mindfulness becomes like that. Because you, you, sort of, you, you really want to find that object, that focus of mindfulness, which is your own mind. You want to find the nirvana. You want to find the Eightfold Path. You want to find whatever you're concentrating on. And what really is it? And what happens is you, get, you push past your label on it. And when you try to go to the object itself beyond the label, it doesn't really fit the label, you realize. There's other aspects to it. And you kind of move into becoming it where you, in a way, can't describe what you're becoming. You just are it. You sort of know it by being it. You sort of get into that range of non-dual experience. And you learn not to be at all, fence yourself off with any concept. And that's true of vipassana. And, when you, and it, when you really want to do that, then mindfulness automatically leads to samadhi, where you become one with everything around you, including the space in which it, it presents itself. You can shift away from whatever it is. You can play with it. You begin to realize the illusoriness of it and so on. Mindfulness is a technique developed by centuries of mind science in practice. The most important thing determining the quality of your life is your mind and your own ability to master your mind. You can be in the best environment and something bothers you emotionally and you're miserable. And something bothers you yeah, and you can be pretty happy even in adversity. Mindfulness gives you a much bigger range of choice and an ability to create gaps and pause your reactions so you can choose to move this way or that way internally. It's really very important. It is the key to developing inner freedom. One practice is to heighten awareness of the inner complexity that normally functions automatically. The workings of the body, for example. This is how most people who get into mindfulness do it, performing a non-judgmental inner opening of awareness as to what it actually is going on inside the body and mind. The natural deeper step of critically seeing through your body's pseudo-purity, your mental sensations pseudo-pleasantness, your seemingly static egocentric mind's pseudo-static fixity, and your pseudo-solid objects of mental experience happens when you go beyond the soothing calm of non-judgmental awareness and become lucid and naturally begin to transform. This is the deep meditation in which the insights from learning and critical investigation are ready to be catapulted by samadhi, one point in total concentration, to lift you out of the coarse body-mind world into the subtle space of natural reality bliss. <laughs> Buddhist psychological science starts from the second noble truth or friendly fact which focuses on the diagnosis of the cause of suffering, misknowing ignorance. Misknowing ignorance causes unawake beings, unlucid beings, to imagine their selves and their world as being other than what they really are. Such beings, bracket I am still am somewhat one of them, so don't feel put down, Unbracket, are like the hero Neo in the film The Matrix, who thinks he is a certain body running around in a certain world. When he is caused to remember, become self-aware as awakened by technical intervention, he realizes that he is actually an unconscious, dream-trapped, embryo-like, grown-up, trapped in a slimy test tube prison. <laughs> 
Luckily, his already awake revolutionary new friends save him as his body gets flushed out to die in a sewer due to his crime of having become unmanageably self-aware. <laughs> so brilliant. This is a beautiful illustration of the initial awakening from misknowing into, gradual, into the gradual learning of mindful knowing. Once you misknow yourself as an alienated, separate being surrounded by the misknown immensity of an absolutely other world, which is what our conceptual interpretation forces us to think we know, you create to lose that separateness by uniting with that world. This may look like you are yet swallowing it as much as possible or being swallowed totally by it. Lust driving you to avoid alienation and fear driving you to avoid contact. At the same time, you may fear both not being able to swallow it all and also being swallowed by it. So you rage against it and lose yourself to hatred, anger, and aggression. The original misknowing of the separation, of course, is the root of both the lust and the hate. When the fully awakened Prince Siddhartha became Shakyamuni Buddha and taught his first human disciples, his five former self-mortifying yogic companions, he emphasized lustful craving as the cause of suffering in order to shock them. They thought they were torturing themselves to get rid of craving, but they were actually doing the opposite, craving escape from reality, seeking a separate state of being by retreating into the illusory experience of the totally misknown, mismanaged, misimagined, static, separate, absolute self, thought to be disconnected from the bothersome relative world. When Siddhartha himself attained enlightenment, he lightened up, felt both body and mind to be really well. To be precise, he became nirvana, all free, all bliss, all the time, everywhere, as everything. He did not fail to be himself. He just came to know who he had really been all the time. I call it ultimate anticlimax. He expanded, but ultimate anticlimax is a climax because <laughs> it's ultimate. He expanded from identifying himself as a static self, separate from all time and space, full of beings and things, to, uh, to, to identify himself as still himself, astonishingly just forever completely one with the whole time and space full of being and things. That is to say, although this was inconceivable in normal terms, he came to be all other beings and things just as much as continuing to be himself. As soon as he found that to be who he really was, he recognized, he found that to be who he really was, he recognized that it was not as if he had changed from one thing into another. He simply came to know what he had always been. His sense of himself as separate, a piece of live physicality, separate from its environment and other beings with a separate self-essence somehow contained within that physicality, was mistaken. It was ignorant misknowledge. Once wisdom cleared away misknowings hold over his awareness, he could simultaneously remember how he felt under misknowledge, realizing how it had always been an illusion, and also know and enjoy that the bliss of release had always been who he really was. Wow. He realized that he had always been enjoying it as his actual nature, while his mind was kept unconscious of the fact by habitual misknowing and thinking of himself as miserable. I know this is impossible to realize two opposite things at once, which is why nirvana is said to be inconceivable and inexpressible, beyond words. It is a sustaining awareness that enhances extreme cognitive dissonance with blissful ease. Impossible though it may be, we already do such a thing.
all the time. The best example is when you look at your face in a mirror. You see a face in there, like yours, except left, right, reversed. If you had never done so, you might reach into the mirror to touch the face there, surprised when your hand bumps into the glass surface. After you have had that surprise many times as a baby, maybe, you know it is only an illusion, a reflection of your own face. That it looks like a three-dimensional space through a window is an illusion. And it's just a reflection on the surface of your own face. You continue to see it in just the same way as, as if it was a three-dimensional room beyond the, the window. And yet you simultaneously know it is not as it seems, but an illusion on the surface of the mirror. Without any strain, you maintain the two knowings, that of the 3D image out in the room beyond the mirror window, and that of its illusoriness. You know them both. You simultaneously reconcile the cognitively dissonant awarenesses of your face as both being there and not really being there. I think this is a good place to stop. It's a very concrete example of how we could be free and happy simultaneously as dealing with difficulties. Just like the difficulties are like seeing the three-dimensional person in the room beyond the mirror window, which looks like us, but left, right is reversed. And then the being happy is the knowledge of the illusoriness of that three-dimensional person through the window. And that it's just a reflection of what's in this three-dimensional room. Corrected simultaneously. That's a very good example. So we'll quit there, okay? So we'll dedicate, it's been about an hour. We will dedicate there. Thank you so much. We dedicated to becoming lucidly awake as quickly as we possibly can in order to help other beings become lucidly awake as much as equal to us so that they can become free of the confusion and the suffering just as we wish to become free of the confusion and suffering, okay? That's how we dedicate the merit, becoming Buddha in order to help all beings so that they can also, we can help them equally become Buddha equal to us and all Buddhas. <laughs>